Today I have uh, 20 minutes uh, to speak with you. Uh, I was very shy growing up. Uh, some people wish I still was shy. <laughs> um, and uh, when you get more experienced with speaking, uh, 20 minutes is about how long it takes you to clear your throat. So today I've got uh, 20 slides in 20 minutes. We're going to set a record for uh, PowerPoint uh, presentations today. Um, my topic today is Edgar Cayce and the New Age. Uh, as Kevin had mentioned, uh, I portray Edgar Cayce in a performance in between after college and before the rest of my life. I had a little brief period where I uh, experimented, played with theater, with acting. I took it quite seriously. I was in New York and in London and did a lot of uh, studying of that uh, craft. And uh, when it came up that uh, the possibility of playing Edgar Cayce, I realized that as an actor, I had done a 20-some year kind of study of Mr. Cayce. I had read almost all of his biographies. I'd read his letters. had quite an uh, in-depth understanding uh, of his life in that way. And then as an actor, what you try to do is you try to go through the person's life, and you have to make choices as an, as an actor. Sometimes the the person you're portraying, their, their choices are evident, and sometimes they're less evident. And as an actor, you go through those uh, times, and you decide for yourself your best interpretation of what that person went through. And um, one of the periods that interested me, I think we all have a period of Edgar Cayce's life that interests us. I know that uh, Sidney Kirkpatrick is very interested in the uh, oil wells period. For me, the period that interested me was the ending of the hospital and then the beginning of the ARE. If, if you know uh, some in-depth uh, past life uh, influences of Edgar Cayce, he had committed suicide in a past life. The Cayce readings talk about suicide as this false belief that you can ever escape something. The false belief, that the, the misunderstanding that life is continuous. And the consequence of... Uh, of suicide from the Casey perspective is not burning in hell and that sort of thing. It's that as a soul, you go back to those experiences or similar experiences to overcome them. That in a way you, you, you shirked perhaps a difficult time in your life when you took your life, when you committed suicide, and then you come back to those and you try to overcome them. In Edgar Casey's life, he had many times where I'm sure that uh, thought uh, form crossed him. He had his photography studio burned to the ground twice. He lost an infant son. His wife nearly died from tuberculosis. And I also believe that time uh, at the end of the hospital was also a very, very uh, difficult time for him. Edgar Casey, it seems to me, had a dream or a vision of having a hospital almost since he began giving readings. He wanted to be able to be helpful to people. He began to realize that people could not get these treatments. They, they would, they, a reading would be given to someone. They'd go to a doctor. They'd say, where'd you get this from? Oh, a psychic in Virginia Beach. And oftentimes, these important readings were not able to be carried out. So his dream was to have a hospital where people could get these treatments coordinated. Now, um, he had had past life experiences with hospitals, so it was not only a desire that was manifesting in this life. As you know, as Ult in Persia, he had been part of hospital-type uh, settings. Certainly with uh, Jesus' example, there was also healing uh, ministry as part of his uh, soul experience. And so it was very clear that he drove a strong intention to have a hospital. Now that hospital, which was his dream, only lasted two years, something that he had been putting all this energy in, uh, moving here to Virginia Beach, getting the resources, putting together, almost like Kevin building the building, just rallying the troops, <laughs> getting the troops around it. Hopefully the building will last a lot longer than two years. But that was two years, and then uh, he walked out of the, uh, the hospital building, uh, I believe it was in the fall of uh, 1930, I believe very defeated. He blamed himself a lot for what had happened. You know, one of the stories that goes is that um, Edgar Casey was put in, the, in an administrator position, and he was not that type. 
You know, if you have a bank and you put, you would not want Edgar Casey to be in charge of, let's say, loans. The people that were least likely to repay the loan, he'd probably give the most money to. That's not the way, ban or maybe that's the way the problem we got into with our, with our banking situation. One of the examples, though, here was that when the uh, Blumenthal's were looking at cost overruns, they were looking at a water cost overrun. All of a sudden, the amount of water being used at the hospital had quadrupled. When they sent their person to come investigate, what Edgar Casey had done was run a hose from the hospital to a neighbor's house who couldn't afford water. That was Edgar Casey's spirit. That was his intention. Not the best business practice, but he led with his heart. He led with his uh, ideals. So today I want to talk, in the, in the 15 minutes I have left now, to talk about this transition and what I've been able just to put together from my uh, fantastic imagination. So this time, from the end of the hospital to the beginning of the ARE. Now, uh, I believe that there was also a transition in ideals, that the, Edgar Casey himself was a Piscean. He talks about uh, Jesus representing that energy. Hugh Lin was also a Pisces. I believe the Piscean ideal has to do with love, but on a one-to-one -one <clears throat> sort of basis. Uh, Harmon Bro tells a story about how uh, he was interested in the possibility of readings being not for individuals, but for ailments. That they could give a reading, let's say, a, or Edgar Casey would give a reading on cancer, or give a reading on diabetes. When in trance, Edgar Casey was asked that question, his answer was, the master took them one at a time, maybe that's just fine. Again, that, uh, that Piscean, that, which Jesus represented, of working with individuals one at a time. And if we look at what Aquarius, or this New Age ideal, it has more to do, I believe, with the collective. And this important reading about the ARE, or about the Casey readings, being able to change the thought of humankind. And perhaps there was this transition from working one-on-one -on -one with people to beginning to work on a larger level, on the level of thought, thinking that our, you know, the, uh, it happens first in spirit, manifests in the mind, and the physical is the result. And so perhaps working with illnesses on the level of the body, they were moving upstream, so to speak, beginning to focus on, on the mind. And so in this time with the ARE, Edgar Cayce initiates what later becomes called the New Age Movement. And I believe that we all agree that the New Age Movement is bigger than Edgar Cayce, and it's bigger than the ARE. I think around the world now, this consciousness of the new age is almost everywhere. Now, what are the tenets of this new age? What is the new age based in? Let me tell you a story that I heard from Mark Thurston. Mark Thurston, here uh, at a lecture, spoke about a time of maybe 10 or 12 years ago when a conservative religious group approached the ARE about um, making a documentary film about different religious and spiritual traditions. So Charles Thomas Casey was the, uh, the director at that time. Some, some directors may have been part of these meetings where this group met with the leadership of the ARE and talked about this documentary. Now, ARE and Charles Thomas was skeptical of this group because they had been very critical of the ARE in the past. Now, the sticking point in this uh, process was that Charles Thomas insisted that the ARE have final say over how the ARE was portrayed in this documentary. This group, through a long process, did not want to give that to the ARE. They wanted to portray, portray the ARE the way that they saw fit. So that was the breakdown in this process. And so once it became clear that this film was not gonna happen, the folks from this group sort of let down their hair. And one of the things they said was, do you know why we don't like you? Now the, the group understood uh, that, um, oh, there's a call coming in. <laughs> um, what what um, the ARE understood was clearly that this group did not like the ARE. That was quite well documented. But to find out why, you know, was it because of the reincarnation perspective? Was it about sin? Was it about something of this nature? And the group said, we don't like you all because you teach that everyone has access to God. How dare you teach that? that everyone have access to God. And their perspective was that you 
have access to God, you had to purchase a ticket through their particular religion. I mean, I'm a little cynical. About that. that That is the tenet of the New Age that came through Edgar Cayce, that everyone does have access to God, that God is the God of all people. This isn't actually in a reading, but it's the theme in many readings. What's the best religion? The one that you'll practice. That the emphasis was put on what you actually do, not what you profess. Edgar Cayce, in his readings, also began to talk about Eastern concepts of spiritual tradition. He began to add to our Western spiritual thought these Eastern concepts. It began to be, in a way, you could say more uh, holistic. Now, how many of you here would define yourself as Christian? Just raise your hand if you'd say you're, you would say you're Christian. Now, maybe you don't, if you go to a church, maybe you don't, whatever however you define that for yourself. Now keep your hands up if you say you're Christian. How many of you would also keep your hands up if, you believe, if you're Christian and you also believe in reincarnation? Now that, that truth now would not have been so 100 years ago. That concept of reincarnation and Christianity were quite separate. And I believe that we owe that to Edgar Cayce in integrating that into our thought. And I think that in a way if we're Christians who believe in these sort of practices, I think we're sort of an integrated type of Christian. You might even say a, a New Age Christian. Maybe that's not the best way to put it. So one of the tenets of the New Age is that God is bigger than his franchises. And that an inclusive view may be the better view. I, I, when I say franchise, I mean the religions. You know, often the, there's many jokes about how, uh, you know, that each religion thinks they have the ticket, that you have to go through their religion to buy your ticket to heaven. The other ones don't have quite as good a ticket, or maybe they don't go to the, uh, the members' lounge in the penthouse. So Edgar Cayce becomes, we know him as the father of holistic medicine. And this is the definition of holism. is the idea that natural s- systems should be, should be viewed as wholes. And I believe that he's also the father of maybe holistic religion or certainly holistic theology. There were not, in, in our Western tradition, there was not this integration of these various spiritual perspectives. I think we're all very comfortable in that. You see, I think on a deep level of our soul, we know this to be true. We know these concepts of reincarnation. We know the, uh, the, the uh, Christian uh, values. But I think that we were hungry for a relationship to God that didn't have to go through these dogmatic principles or, or teachings that somehow were exclusionary. You know, the, the belief that, uh, that a fundamental belief that a Christian can have that you can only access God through Jesus Christ or through Islam. On our soul level, we knew that not to be true, and I think we were right for this teaching, and I believe that's why this teaching is so much broader than Edgar Cayce. It's just true. I think Edgar Cayce was the forerunner of it, but that's why it spread from coast to coast around the world. And here's just some of these Western theological concepts and then the Eastern. The West is, you know, we're the talkers of the world. And in the East is more the listeners, the, the receptive versus the active principles. The Western is a focus on the individual. Eastern is on the collective you know, Confucian uh, thought. Here we are very comfortable with know thyself. It's actually one of the chapters in the search for God. Eastern is more lose thyself. The whole is more important. Forgiveness, karma, redemption, these are some of the concepts that come from an integrated perspective. See, I also believe that, uh, that we see the great teachers separately, but when you work with a concept, let's say, of forgiveness, It's not by chance, in my perspective, that 500 years ago, a great teacher came to teach us compassion because compassion is integral in forgiveness. Compassion is a step towards forgiveness. So in order for for Jesus to bring in forgiveness as the focus of his teaching, another great teacher had to come in first to work on compassion. And then here, Edgar Cayce, the uniter. Remember, we were just talking about this this dilemma, know thyself, no, lose thyself, know thyself. It reminds me a little bit of an argument I had with my ex-wife, my ex-Japanese wife, where we, uh, we had that conflict about, I remember when we talked about going to counseling, uh, Mickey was 
you want me to sit for an hour and talk about myself? Are you crazy? And I'm like, yeah, that's how I make my living. But people do. It was just a very radical concept to think of the self, the individual, as important. But Edgar Cayce, in this reading, puts it together that the purpose of life in some way is to know thyself, to be thyself, that kind of what we're comfortable in a Western mind frame, and yet be one with God or creative forces. This is more the Eastern perspective. So what he says is, yes, both are important. The Western perspective, knowing yourself, and the Eastern perspective of losing yourself. So it says to know yourself and to lose yourself. It may sound simple, but that, that, this reading here integrates two very, what had been opposed uh, ways of thinking about uh, ourselves and about our relationship to, uh, to the Creator. And then <laughs> uh, Casey's readings on Jesus is another uh, dimension to his readings or to the material about the New Age. Just, we're familiar with this about you know, Casey's readings about Jesus having had past lives, that he was part of other religions in past lives, and in those lost years, he was part of uh, remembering from uh, past uh, religious experience. And so that Christianity, in a way, is a derivative religion, knowing that we know that Christianity is based on Judaism, but Casey puts it also derivative of time that he spent in India, that the Indian traditions were part of uh, Jesus' formation. That in past lives, in a past life, he had been involved with Zoroastrianism. And that he went to Persia in those times. To, if, you look at, if you read about Zoroastrian uh, belief, very Christian, very compatible. And then if also his time in Egypt. In a past life, he'd been involved with Egypt. And as Edgar Cayce, he had spent time in Egypt uh, going through the, uh, the initiation. And you know, what's the, one of the main purposes of the pyramid is it teaches you that there is no death. So the, the symbol of the, is that everlasting life or victory over death, which becomes one of the core teachings of Jesus' life, the resurrection, that there is no death. And Casey's broad definition of the Christ consciousness. It's imprinted in pattern on the mind, awaiting to be awakened by the will, of the soul's oneness with God. I don't see Jesus' name there. So Christ is a consciousness. Jesus was a man. And that this is irrespective of any religion. You can have, you, we all have imprinted in, our, in pattern on the mind, awaiting to be awakened by the will, our soul's oneness with God. This here is irrespective. There's no trademark here not of the soul's oneness with the Baptist church or whatever other access point. So the point here is that this Christ consciousness from Casey's perspective is once again, it's broad. It's accessible to everyone. You don't have to have ever heard of a teacher at one of the uh, avatars to practice this. Awakening in your will, your oneness with God. So again, just reviewing these tenets of the New Age movement. I may have uh, <laughs> been so worried with time, I actually buzzed through my 19 uh, slides. So we all have access to God. There's one God, many religions. The different spiritual traditions have merit. And that somehow, as I said earlier, the collective view, you know, the, the story of the, uh, of the three blind people and the elephant, that each one has their view, if we can integrate that. And I believe that's what Edgar Cayce invites us to into an integrated experience of God, of what God is and how we can relate to God. And again, using parts from different traditions. And it's a movement towards a oneness religion thought which encompasses the East, West, indigenous, and ancient traditions. So in the future, you know, we're really at this kind of dawn of this Aquarian age or this new age. I believe that there's the potential from what is being planted here and now that down the road, a thousand years or fifteen hundred years down down the way, that there becomes a one religion. It becomes a one religion, one God manifestation in the earth. And I believe it'll be an integrated perspective. That we'll have understand that these different traditions saw perspectives of God and that they have they will become integrated. Any questions?
Yes, Zygmunt. How do you find yourself? Uh, hmm. Hmm. Meet with me later. Uh, give me some time to think on that one. Anyone else? Any other thoughts, questions, ideas? Good. Thank you. Thank you.